again, welcome to the VDW International Talks, one of ACID's initiatives of reaching out to our audience from different parts of the world through dialogues in art and design. As mentioned earlier today, today's talk will be hosted and moderated by our special guest, architect Tobias Guggenheimer. Architect Guggenheimer is a Swiss-American architect, design educator, and author. He is the principal of Tobias Guggenheimer Architect PC, which was established in New York in 1991. The firm, um, he is the, the firm has engaged in broad range of projects in residential commercial, hospitality, furniture, and other types of design typologies. Architect Guggenheimer also has a long history of academic and scholarly work. He was a professor at Pratt Institute School of Architecture for more than a decade and was also a senior administrator for a time. He was also the director of the interior design program at the Marymount campus of Fordham University. At Parsons School of Design, he taught interior design studio and served as assistant chair for the interior design department. In the Philippines, he served as dean and VP for academics at SOFA Design Institute. Architect Guggenheimer has also authored the book, Ateliesen Legacy, The Architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright's Apprentices. He has lectured on a broad range of design topics at venues including the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, the International Design Conference in Taipei, the Anthology Conference in Manila, and served as the overall creative and curatorial director of the Digital Artisans Program of the Design Center of the Philippines. So ladies and gentlemen, architect Tobias Guggenheimer. Denise, uh, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists and the many participants from around the world to this real-time, if virtual, symposium. And to all the initiators of ACID, congratulations. And thank you for creating this virtual platform for the exchange of ideas in design. As Denise mentioned, I'm Tobias Guggenheimer, a Swiss-American architect. Uh, been based in the Philippines from where I'm now speaking. And whereas Denise also mentioned, I uh, was involved in the academe uh, by virtue of my deanship at uh, a new design school uh, that Denise was very instrumental also in helping to evolve. In light of the topics to be addressed in this event, I might add that uh, my resume also includes builder, which was in my younger, and I was in my younger days, a fairly proficient carpenter. In fact, when I was in my 20s, I built a house more or less single-handedly from the foundation to the roof, almost entirely of uh, recycled materials. Uh, but more about why that may be pertinent a little bit later. Bob Dylan once sang, the times they are changing. I'm not sure he was referring to the digital revolution and architecture, but certainly he was correct, generally speaking. Of course, he could as easily have changed a title to the times are always changing. The speakers tonight will shed light upon some important ways that the definition, the objectives, and even our relationship with the process and the output of design is evolving. It is, as Bob might say, a changing. Most of us will be listening to this discussion in a comfortable private environment, connected via electrons that are pulsating, from one living room, studio, or office to another, and that we are, for the moment, sheltered from some of the ill winds blowing throughout the world. But it may be helpful for us to open a window, at least metaphorically, as we listen, remaining conscious of the muffled cries and whispers of various manifestations of human rights, I'm sorry, uh, various uh, to the muffled cries and whispers of those who are neither comfortable nor satisfied 
with the status quo regarding the environment, manifestations of human rights, political structures, and other issues that have proven difficult to address through design. And in so doing, we should try to imagine who among the people of this earth will welcome our speaker's findings and who will not. Who will anticipate, promote, and embrace their insights? And who will feel stimulated but insecure, perhaps dislocated by examples of technologically enhanced and intellectually sharpened creativity? The writer William Faulkner famously said that the past is never dead. It's not even past. Perhaps we can coin a similar adage today about the future, that the future is not solely located in the future. It's here today. It is all around us. It's here tonight. The discussions that we are about to have will, I think, bring at least a sliver of that future into focus. Much has been said in the last several decades about the impact of globalization, a phenomenon that is usually described in mercantile terms, but globalization is not and has really never been primarily about ships circumnavigating the oceans for the exchange of goods in exotic ports. The real impact of globalization has been the circumnavigation of those very same oceans for the exchange of ideas in the form of knowledge and ideology that eventually informs culture. In that respect, this event is a cultural event that makes us willing participants in this most distilled and potent form of globalization. As we listen and observe the presentations of our exemplary panelists, I urge our audience uh, to promote and anticipate dialogue by submitting questions and observations uh, via the chat functions that have been established and that Denise uh, described a little bit earlier. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers, uh, Andrea Macruz and Marcus Farr. They will be uh, presenting jointly, and so I'm going to offer their biographies. I'm going to we offer their uh, biographies uh, 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 together. Andrea holds a BA in architecture from the Universidad Presbyteriana Mackenzie in Sao Paulo, a master's in biodigital architecture from the Universidad Internacional de Catalunya in Barcelona, and a master's in contemporary furniture design from Instituto Marangoni in Milan. She is currently part of the Digital Futures PhD program at Dongji University in Shanghai. And Andrea is joining us from Sao Paulo. Her colleague, Marcus Farr, who is joining us from the American University of Sharjah is an American architect and a Fulbright scholar in architecture who researches tectonics throughout Asia. He's an assistant professor of architecture and director of the Material Artifact Studio focusing on contemporary materials and methods. He has recently exhibited work as an artist in residence at venues in Hungary, Iceland, Spain, China, and Japan. His initial architectural studies were conducted at Rice University. So uh, Marcus and Andrea, uh, we welcome you to this uh, discussion and thank you for kicking things off. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you, Tobias, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Asset, for this lovely opportunity to be here. So uh, Marcus and I will present together uh, this work. I will share screen. So our work is called uh, Synergistic Space Potentials. Um, and uh, technology humans and responsive materials in the design process. Uh, we did along with uh, Alexandre Uso, and uh, this is the index of the presentation. It all started uh, with a performance of Marina Abramovic and her ex-husband, 
so they sit on a table and without talking anything, they look at each other and they get a deeper understanding of what each one is feeling without having anything. Uh, after that, we thought how we could, uh, how to humanize humans through technology. So if communicating about feelings and attitudes, words account only for 7% of the total message that people receive, that's a little, very little number. So the aim of the project was to improve verbal and nonverbal communication between people through technology. So understanding without having to say. Usually people personalize their work desks. They bring their photo of their child, their family, plants, and so on and so forth. And we thought, okay, how we could design a table that, that could be a work table that could be personalized and uh, that could say something uh, and explore this kind of nonverbal communication. So to design less things, but with a greater impact. And uh, along with the idea of um, Andy Clark that says that we are already cyborgs because we use uh, phone, computers and sensors as an extended mind. So how we can join this idea of Andy Clark with Marina to um, uh, design a project. So we thought about a table that changed color and materials according how someone is feeling. So if I work in, I'm working with a person and I see that in the day, the person is feeling kind of blue, how I can change, uh, talk to her differently or change my approach with her because I know that she's in a sensitive day and uh, yeah, how, how, I can, uh, how I can change my approach with this person in order for her to feel more comfortable and in order for our conversation to go better, to flow better, we have a better co conversation through that. This process of simulation also aids in creating a more robust prototype for us as we move into the materials and technologies that make this project a reality. We start to explore how these materials can change and embrace the communication that Andrea is discussing in a physical way. And in this project diagram, we uh, start to illustrate uh, the kind of invisible parts of the project, which have the sensorial boundaries that we thought about when designing the table, the, the possible gradients involved, um, both man-made and human, such as Wi-Fi, sensorium, temperature, uh, along with the scale of the table. And uh, in the plan diagram, you can see um, that we're interested in the perception of the table with uh, human interaction. We started the process in design working with uh, computational software such as Grasshopper, um, Houdini, uh, thinking about uh, the role of a microcontroller in the process, paired also with physical testing. Uh, but we're interested in, in kind of interrogating the workflow between computational design, material logics, and using the computer to assist us in making decisions um, that are kind of part of the design, but also the physical prototype. Um, we also use the Houdini model to explore how color could be simulated uh, with an up mood logarithm and a uh, rhino model to, um, to assist with the visual, uh, visual capacity of the different material states, such as changes in compositions, uh, different profiles of leaves uh, and petals involved in the process that would begin to move and what those, how those would interact as a composition. Uh, part of the discussion included the logic for the shape the actual shape of the leaves that are involved on the on the surface of the table and how that could uh, inform the overall project. In this image, you can see the leaves on a tree 
are actually different in certain um, cross sections of the tree. They have different performative values. Some are sun leaves, uh, which are comparatively smaller with jagged ed edge conditions, and some are smaller. The drawings on the right, you can see uh, how we started to translate those uh, into uh, drawings that would be uh, laser cut and, and tested. There were three profiles that we decided upon as we moved through the testing phase. And um, really these were, these were discussed in terms of their capacity to move uh, uh, up and down and the capacity to maintain a compositional structure as they, uh, as they got heated. Um, with, as we begin re researching and manufacturing our own material combinations here, it became clear that uh, extremely thin material, uh, uh, such as paper uh, and uh, metal, started to be um, started to respond most successfully to our criteria. And the metal allowed for rigidity, and the paper allowed for more direct uh, relationship with thermochromic paint and temperature difference. Um, these are electrical resistance coils. Uh, uh, used in the testing process, and we're testing and discussing a range of, of power options available here, um, ranging from uh, different thermostat settings. Uh, uh, at 500 watts, the biomaterial begins to bend, and we notice that the higher the temperature, the more the metal deforms and the more it becomes responsive. The activation temperature for the thermochromic paint uh, is 30 degrees Celsius, and ultimately the decision was made to utilize the, the uh, leaf profiles in our morphologies that bended the best and worked with our physical testing that you can see here. And so it helped us to simplify the process and to make decisions about uh, the overall outcome of the table. Uh, And uh, here you can see another physical test that involves uh, Luco dye, water-based thermochromic ink. And um, with this, the colors can change in the presence of a temperature variation. And so uh, we found that the Luco dye is a process available for different ranges from uh, 23 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius. And the range of colors depends on uh, on how the material interacts with, uh, with heat. Uh, so here we have a diagram of the table. You have a glass top and you have the petals underneath and how the biomaterial banded. So it takes more or less 40 seconds for it to bend uh, and more or less two minutes to return to the initial position. And also uh, Charlie from Upmoot, he kindly gave us a some sensors to test with the table. So uh, it's a bracelet that you, you put and uh, the information goes to an app and says, how are you feeling? Uh, so we use this sensor to do the project. And uh, there, uh, according to, the, to the, um, your emotion, the table changed color. Here you can see one person going more to the blues and one more uh, color going more to the reds and change uh, shape as well. So you have a QR code that's linked to the uh, in the app of the sensor and we pick this information. Uh, this information goes to a, a microprocessor that activates the table. Here you can see the section of the table. So you have the coil, the resistance uh, coil here underneath and then you have the petals and uh, on the top you have the glass. And uh, so Alexandre, um, he worked on this part. He did a microprocessor uh, to catch from uh, with Wi-Fi the information that was going out of the app along with Charlie and it changed the color of the table. So. Uh, here you have all the emotions that a mood can uh, pick, and we divided into a calm uh, and aroused. 
So when you're calm, the, street, the leaves are straight and they are blue. And when you're aroused, the leaves bend and they are uh, pink. So here you have the calm and the aroused videos activating or not the table. So the calm goes to the microprocessor that then activate the table. So the leaves are blue and not bended and on the contrary of the aroused um, emotion. And here you have a di diagram with more people using the table. So a part of the table is act being activated according to the number of people that are using the table. And this is a drawing, so you can see the leaves uh, bending and changing colors. So that, that's it. Thank you very much for the, this opportunity. Thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Andrea and Marcus. Uh, your presentation stimulated a lot of very, very interesting uh, questions in my mind that I, I look forward to getting to very, very soon. Um, next, I would like to introduce Denise Javier, also of Sao Paulo. Um, Denise is architect and professor at Centro Universitario de Bellas Artes in Sao Paulo. Uh, she is also author of the book Architect Architectura Metropolitana and is currently involved in research on street furniture and new uses of urban space. She's a doctoral student of architecture and urbanism at McKenzie University of Sao Paulo, where her research is being conducted. Denise, please. Denise, I think you're muted. And easy, I think you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, thank you, Tobias, for introducing me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with the, uh, these amazing uh, professionals. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you, Andrea, Marcus, and Juan, uh, for sharing this experience with me. And I, I was also uh, would like to thank uh, ACID for the promotion of this uh, design event. I consider this a great opportunity to exchange experience and try to implement by technology issue, positive action and examples. As a matter of fact, I believe uh, that such forum can help us uh, to create subtract that could help uh, us to overcome uh, this huge crisis we are facing today in the world. In my opinion, we are going to get out of this situation stronger and more resilient than before. But I don't think there is a magic solution. I believe in the development of alternatives built by the sum uh, of several good little things, several, several good little actions that could result 
in a more inclusive reality. Uh, so, it's one of these uh, little action I intend to show you today. But before I start, I uh, explaining this uh, the proposal of this uh, didactical experience. I would like to highlight that at the beginning of the experiment, the main goal was to get the student attention. However, as time went by, the results were better than we expected. They made us to notice the relevance of what we are doing. Uh, I said we because this work I'm going to show you, it isn't one man job. It's a collective experience. I had been always supported by amazing colleagues that share this path with me. I'd like to highlight the precious contribution of Liliane Simi, Luis Otavio Rocha, and their Marcus, who is here today. She's a great enthusiast and uh, of this experience. Well, let me illustrate, let me share the screen. Well, uh, as I said uh, before, this uh, experience uh, takes place in a discipline, in architecture course, uh, and has the proposal to introduce uh, the subject of design and digital fabrication for the students. Uh, during the class, the students uh, are guiding to conceive and build a prototype. Uh, instead of uh, being just a task for the student to achieve the credits, uh, and this could uh, represent a waste of creative uh, energy, material, time, etc., and avoiding a product with uncertain destiny, we thought uh, it could be different if we make this exercise as real as possible. So we pursued uh, some real issue that the student could respond, as well as we seek for a partner to sponsor the material expenses. With this new format of the discipline, uh, we intend to multiply the results and make the whole process more rational uh, and sustainable, while we could uh, benefit with the community uh, with the no donation of the prototype, making a better destiny for that. Well, it's very known here in Brazil, we face a huge social inequality. In this context, uh, private universities have the ethical commitment to contribute to this scenario, formulating answers and regard regarding the social matter. One important contribution could be the development of collective consciousness. This would be valued. The university can and should teach the students to have an humanitarian attitude. Offering a clear notion about the place they occupy, in which context they are living in, and finally make them thinking about how they could collaborate with community. In my point of view, uh, this is the most important mission we have as a professor, teaching through the practice of empathy. Thus, the exercise is to propose to, to, propose to the student uh, is to design a playroom furniture. All the prototypes are donated to a children's care entity to create a playroom space. This is the process. Uh, it makes uh, eight steps to, to be done. Uh, at the beginning of the process, students receive theoretical context 
about design to support the research. At the moment, uh, they, they receive the rules of the exercise. So, in this way, to create a furniture, the group must follow the, these rules. Uh, each team can use only uh, one uh, MDF board. Some other materials may be allowed to be used to make the soft parts of the object. Uh, the prototype should be made by in fitting system. Here, uh, glue and nails are prohibited. To attach the piece, uh, it's allowed to, to use a screw and nut. The prototype must be uh, or should be demountable. Uh, the design must be conceived for a digital fabrication. And finally, uh, the object must say something to the children. It means that uh, uh, the, the object must communicate some sense in his, its forms. On the second step, the students are encouraged to make a prior visit to meet the children and to be aware of the needs of the institution. These visits help them to be conscious of the responsibility of dealing with real people and real demands. To generate an aesthetic motivation to guide the students in the, the projects, uh, we've already used uh, in our past conceptual word, as you can see here, uh, these words are verbs, it, it makes some uh, notion of uh, action. We also uh, got inspiration on Brazilian art, uh, artist work, in this case contemporary art. And recently we've adopted the content, content uh, at the children's literacy. On this way, uh, each group chose uh, a book to help them to elaborate the furniture. Here the idea is to make the design a kind of augmented reality of the story and then the subliminal uh, subject is to invite the children to develop uh, the habits of reading while they are inter interacting with the object. On the fourth step, uh, the student developed a few, a few models to test the proportion and the ability. After testing the physical models, students go to the digital fabrication itself. Here you can see some students working at the digital project. After the machine work, uh, it's time to deal with the manu man manual labor. So we reach the assembly the face and then finishing stage. At the end of the, uh, the semester, when uh, everything is ready, we organized an uh, inauguration party of the playroom space. And this is a very special moment for the student and the child. The moment when the student perceives the effect of his creation in these mini users. Usually, uh, when the children are introduced to the object, they got very excited. They jump into it, exploring every detail, testing, 
and uh, inviting, in, inventing a, an expected ways to use it. And this whole process happened in just five minutes. Five minutes of surprise, five minutes of gratitude, fantasy, and euphoria, all together. At this point, the student noticed the pleasure to create something for someone, of putting himself in someone's position and try to somehow to qualify the someone's experience. Uh, that is the experience I want to bring to you today. My intention when I made this presentation was not just show the production of the discipline or some beautiful image uh, from children or students. In fact, my biggest motivation today was to share a reflection of why this experience has been so successful until now. Uh, here you, you can see some numbers that demonstrate this. My hypothesis is that uh, when we work, we become what we are doing. Our work is an exteriority of who we are, an expression of who we are. By making an object, we transform ourselves into things, beautiful things. However, for this action to reach an integral sense, it needs to touch the other. It needs to be realized in the other. So in this way, there is a no credit act that can be done alone. We need the others. We need to include the other in us. That's the empathetic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely presentation. Um, I look forward to digging beneath the, the surface a little bit of that experience with your students and the community in just. But first, I'd like to introduce our last speaker, Juan Rufino, who is coming to us from uh, Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Um, with a presentation of his work that is titled Objectural. Uh, Juan is a, holds a Doctor of Architecture from Hiroshima University in Japan, which he earned in 2002. He's a practicing architect who teaches theory and architectural design at the University of Santo Domingo. He is also a coordinator of architectural innovation at NPHU and is the chief editor of the magazine Umbriel. Uh, essays on architectural innovation. Juan has published articles on the future thinking of architecture and has designed and built projects that range from housing to international film studios. Juan Rufino, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias, for, for your kind introduction. Uh, Thanks to also thanks to Acid and especially to to Alan Garcia for having for have invited me today to to join with you. Uh, I'm glad actually to 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 share this table with such talent like Andrea, uh, Marcus, and Denise. I'm really thankful for that. So. Yes. So the talk that we are going to introduce today, because we think it's a, it's a, it's a, it will be an introduction to the topic, is named Objectual. 
uh, is one of the concepts that we have been working in the coordination of, of architectural innovation at Universidad Nacional Pedro Enrique Sureña. And uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the ideas that we have been publishing uh, since last year. The talk uh, today will be about first we, we will make a, a small coordinate I mean a small introduction to the a brief coordinate uh, a brief introduction to the coordination of architectural innovation then we will uh, introduce you also uh, uh, what we understand what architecture is just to give you a framework of uh, the idea of architecture that we are thinking about then we, we will develop a little bit more on the concept of, of objectual. And at the end, we will open questions on the future thinking of the digital world. This presentation will be uh, graphic, but with uh, uh, letters, I mean, with, with words. So you can listen to me and you can look at the, at, at the slides and you can also build or construct your own thinking about it. When we think about innovation, we firstly think about tangible intentions. And in the coordination of in architectural innovation, we think that besides tangible inventions, we can also regard innovation as a reinvention of concepts that can help us to achieve a new kind of architecture in the future. That means that besides dealing and working with tangible inventions, we can also collaborate and contribute with intellectual innovations. But we understand that ideas alone is not, uh, is not enough to work in architecture or design. So we have to combine ideas to what we call actuators, for instance, the budget, quality control, the lifestyle, and any other element that can ground idea to reality. And combining ideas with actuators, we, can, uh, we could be able to materialize projects, which is, I think, uh, very important for any, art, for, for any academic program. One of the products that we have been uh, doing, because the coordination is somehow uh, young, we have been working since two years ago. Uh, one of the products is uh, uh, essays and academic papers. So, and we have in the university two magazines that we have been publishing this, these ideas. One magazine is Aula, which is the social sciences and humanities uh, journal. And the other magazine or journal is, uh, is Umbriel, which is the coordination of architectural innovation magazine. And the speciality of, of Umbriel is that is addressed to students. That means that that's a, uh, it's, a, it's a medium for students to share with the community their intellectual insights on the profession. Uh, when we think about architecture, we don't think, we do not try to find a, a definition of this, but we try to understand what architecture does. And uh, to us, one of the things that architecture could do is that architecture has the capacity to define places through tangible elements, which means that architecture, regarding to the topic we are discussing today, architecture could be an objectual fact. And in this dynamic, we can understand how object and idea are automatic connected. Objectual, just to give you an, an introductory definition of the topic, is about the reinterpretation of tangible qualities that are fundamental to construct future digital worlds. That means that we need to understand the tangible qualities of objects in order to improve or to advance the, the, <clears throat> the digital experimentations that we could do uh, in our laboratories. And following that, we think that uh, objects may have multiple, almost infinite qualities, but we are addressing to four qualities that 
we consider are very important to understand the, the, the relation between the tangible and the intangible or, or digital worlds. The first quality is that objects are ideal, you know, the object is an idea, per se. Objects are a plastic thing, objects become data, and objects are also an environment. And all of this is in a constant process, which means that, the pro that objects are uh, usually and constantly in, in becoming, for instance, becoming ideas, becoming plastic things, becoming data or information, and becoming an environment. Ideal, well, uh, the quality of ideal, it goes to and is connected to ideal, idea, ideal itself, or idealistic, all these things together. And it connects us with the tangible in the way that we first or originally we imagine architecture. Ideal because it also deals with innovation and innovation is not necessarily a tangible thing. Innovation could be regarded as a field where anything is possible or in other words, innovation could be the ecosystem of the imagination. Idea and connected to imagination needs to be extended or communicated through, let's say, traditional means like written or audiovisual. And in this dynamic, uh, the quality of ideal or the ideal object oscillates or goes between the quality of object and the state of thought. Objects become plastic or so, or have the plastic quality or plasticity, and it could be easily seen in the geometry, in this case, in the geometry of architecture. And because of that, we understand that that geometry, that plasticity has a dual, has a twofold, uh, 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 has a twofold meaning, which is sign and significance at the same time. Significance, not only because of meaning, but significance because it's important or relevant for the architectural thought. Plastic also, the plastic quality is an evidence that architecture is a socio-economic cultural achievement of civilization. We have seen this through the whole history of architecture or, or through the whole uh, uh, history and progress of civilization. The plastic also is the evidence that we have to intellectualize empirical processes or to materialize the intellectual findings. That means that it's not enough to create ideas, we have to materialize ideas, and it's not enough only to deal with the manufacturing, with the fabrication or construction. It's really important to intellectualize those processes as well. Uh, the object becomes data, as we think, or the data quality of objects is also between uh, the matter and the information. It's a kind of compression, but it's a very special compression, but because it's not a, spread, it's not a compression only of the, of the object itself, but of the, all the disciplines that are uh, actuating or interacting each other in order to produce and build the object. It means also that uh, data, which is an intangible thing for us, although it's very tangible for the digital world, data becomes a universal culture. Universal because we are all connected today through data. It's impossible to not think about any human activity without data, either digital or analog, but we are always surrounded by data, like we are surrounded by music, by art and, and food. So data today we consider is a universal culture. Data also release, I mean, the input to imagine, to materialize, to program architecture or design objects. And it's always gravitating between the aesthetic, precision, the subjective and calculus, uh, helping us to understand that we always deal with information that is communicated through, in, through uh, uh, information technology means.
awesome environment become an environment and could have environmental qualities uh, because we directly perceive it through the sensual to the optical in case of architecture where optical is very important that is uh, represented through light and materials but the most important of all this is that this environmental quality raises in us an environmental consciousness not only an environmental consciousness in terms of uh, the sustainability but also because objects are part of the environment and objects could be an environment in itself like the city or building for instance which which are large objects but they are object and environment at the same time it means that in this state with these qualities the object becomes an atmosphere and this atmosphere speaks about the poetic quality of architecture or the poetry in architecture with all this in mind we understand that architecture sets a field of action a field of movement beyond contemplation where the tangible provokes and anything beyond the physical and founds a dynamic that could create new architectural worlds and there are open questions for us one question is concerning to scale for instance, we always think about the scale of objects as something static, unmutable, but scales also could be dynamic. And we think that, for instance, we have big two of what we call dynamic scales, one which is molecular and the other which is uh, immersive. The molecular one, which is invisible to us, is in constant formation, is the one we could see, for example, in the work that has presented Marcus and Andrea, uh, that they deal with the molecular quality of, of objects in order to create those, uh, those objects that are almost alive. And in the other hand, uh, uh, the immersive uh, uh, scale is indeterminate, is progressive, it has to do with speed, with velocity, for instance, and is the one that we could experience through the walkthrough in the virtual reality world, for instance. It's a, it's a scale that uh, where the object could actually change, you know, in terms of size, that it's not only depend on the human eye, but, but of the human movement as well. We also think that there is an open question on, on, on research, you know. We have been researching maybe using another methods from other disciplines like the scientific method and all this. But I think if we have to advance uh, into a more deeper digital world or virtual worlds, we have to understand and try to find another way of researching all the things that we are doing. So we could enhance the graphics, the text, the models, the photographs, or means that could be beyond our imagination. And to complete this presentation, we leave an open question, which is what lies beyond the digital? What actually we could achieve once we achieve, I mean, or, or, or once we could uh, uh, get into a pure digital world. Thank you very much.